Heart failure is a condition in which the heart is no longer able to meet the perfusion demands of the body. It can be divided in several ways, acute or chronic, heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction or with a preserved ejection fraction, as well as left-sided or right-sided heart failure. So let's start with a bit of physiology on the cardiac output. This is the volume of blood pumped by the heart in one minute. It's given by the stroke volume multiplied by the heart rate. The stroke volume is the volume of blood pumped in one single heartbeat and this is normally around 70 milliliters. For example, if we take a normal resting heart rate of 70 beats per minute, this works out to be a cardiac output of 4,900 milliliters per minute, so approximately 5 liters per minute. Remember though, that not all the blood in the ventricle gets pumped out during systole. The volume of blood in the ventricle before it starts contracting is around 110 milliliters, and this is known as the end diastolic volume. Typically, only 70 milliliters gets pumped out, and that's the stroke volume, like we said. So, what does ejection fraction mean? Ejection fraction is essentially showing you how much blood is pumped out of the ventricle compared to the total volume of blood in the ventricle at the beginning of contraction. It's usually shown as a percentage. So as an example, if we have a stroke volume of 70 milliliters and an end diastolic volume of 110, so again, the volume of blood in the ventricle before it starts contracting, the ejection fraction is 70 divided by 110 which is about 64%. A normal ejection fraction is between 55 and 70%. In acute heart failure, the heart inability to pump blood has happened suddenly, and the most common causes include myocardial infarction, acute valvulopathy, for example, the sudden rupture of a papillary muscle in a patient who recently had an MI, generating an acute and massive mitral regurgitation, arrhythmias, ventricular fibrillation for example, pulmonary embolism, myocarditis and drugs such as beta blockers if used inappropriately. These patients can move quickly towards cardiogenic shock which is where they'll be hypotensive and you'll see lactate levels rising. In that case you'll need to remove the underlying cause for example reperfusion in a myocardial infarction, restoration of sinus rhythm in an arrhythmia and surgery in an acute valvular problem. Then, the heart may need to be supported, and you may give ionotropic agents like dobutamine, epinephrine, or levosimondan, or you may use mechanical devices such as the aortic balloon pump or even ECMO. Now let's go over chronic heart failure. Like I said earlier, we can divide it into heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction or heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction. We already said that a normal ejection fraction is between 55 and 70%, but to be classed as a reduced ejection fraction, the value typically needs to be below 40%. Examples of heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction include a decrease in contractility, like in myocardial infarction, chronic volume overload from mitral regurgitation or aortic regurgitation, or dilated cardiomyopathies. You can also have it from chronic pressure overload, so from an advanced aortic stenosis or uncontrolled hypertension. Heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction comes from impaired diastolic filling, seen in left ventricular hypertrophy, myocardial fibrosis, restrictive cardiomyopathy, pericarditis or constriction from tamponade, as well as valvular disease like mitral stenosis. Essentially, these are causes of systolic, so reduced ejection fraction, or diastolic failure, preserved ejection fraction. But bear in mind that often these causes can overlap and contribute to each other. An older way of looking at heart failure is left and right sided heart failure. They can have different causes and some different clinical features. But once again, these aren't black and white distinctions because they have significant overlap. For example, the most common cause of right-sided heart failure is left-sided heart failure. So generally, what we're talking about when discussing right or left-sided heart failure is where the problem started. Left-sided heart failure is most commonly caused by coronary artery disease, myocardial infarction, or chronically high blood pressure levels. 
The features seen in left-sided heart failure include pulmonary edema. Initially, we may hear rails or crackles in the lung bases, but will be throughout the lung fields when severe. Dyspnea, orthopnea, which is a shortness of breath when lying down that occurs due to increased return of blood to the heart. Cyanosis and hypoxia, weakness and easy fatigability, and physical exam may show a displaced apex beat, where the apex is felt more laterally than usual. It's a finding typical in dilated hearts. Additional heart sounds such as S3 or S4 or even heart murmurs may also be present. As I said, right-sided heart failure is most commonly caused by left-sided heart failure. The backup of blood into the pulmonary circulation increases the work the right ventricle needs to do in order to maintain flow through the lungs. This is also true for pulmonary hypertension. Pulmonary embolism may also cause right-sided heart failure, but often the increased pressure in the right side of the heart caused by the embolus can cause the interventricular septum to be pushed to the left side, impeding left-sided function. Myocardial infarction involving the right ventricle can also cause it. Clinical features include peripheral edema, ascites, an increased jugular venous pressure. You may also see hepatosplenomegaly and hepatojugular reflux. And this is a clinical sign where pushing on the liver causes blood that is stagnant in the liver to be pushed up and is seen as an increase in the jugular vein distension. Diagnosis is made on the basis of clinical features, an ECG, lab investigations and imaging. ECG changes aren't specific enough to diagnose heart failure, but seeing a normal ECG is very suggestive that there isn't left ventricular systolic dysfunction. You can look for right or left ventricular hypertrophy and conduction delays like a left bundle branch block. Lab investigations include B-type natriuretic peptide, a hormone released by cardiomyocytes in response to stretching caused by increased ventricular volumes. Electrolytes such as sodium and potassium, renal and liver function tests, and cardiac biomarkers if myocardial infarction is suspected. Imaging studies include a chest x-ray, which may show pulmonary edema, increased dimensions of the heart, shown by the cardiothoracic ratio that shows the proportion between the heart and the chest. This is normally less than 0.5. The most common method of assessing heart failure definitively though is cardiac ultrasound, as it allows us to see the heart in real time, as well as to take measurements of the volumes and thicknesses, as well as the ejection fraction. For treatment and management, you may recommend lifestyle changes, for example, smoking cessation, losing weight, encouraging exercise, but be careful not to overdo it. Exercise programs need to be tailored to the individual and things like diet modifications, like a low salt one, a Mediterranean or fluid restriction diet can help ease symptoms. Medications include ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers, beta blockers, but again, be careful not to depress cardiac activity too much or you'll cause heart failure. Diuretics, aldosterone antagonists like spironolactone, which is also a diuretic. And finally, digoxin in some refractory patients.